Uh, good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Daniel Kirsch, and I'm a professor in this department. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker and my old friend, Mark O'Malley. Uh, Mark O'Malley is chief scientist at the National Renewable Energy Labs, where he directs the energy system integration uh, part of the lab. He's also on sabbatical leave from University College Dublin in Ireland, where he's a deep professor of electrical engineering. Uh, Mark has a number of honors to his name. He's a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a member of the Royal Irish Academy, and a fellow of the Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineering. So, Mark, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So, uh, the, the problem with this is I've signed this, so the lecture is gonna be dramatically different because by signing this, I'm saying they can release it, therefore I can't really say what I believe, but. But I have a tendency to say what I believe anyway, so we'll go with that. Uh, just with regard to the Royal Irish Academy, I'm an Irishman, and uh, I object strongly to the fact that our National Academy of Science in Ireland is called the Royal Irish Academy, but I have enough fights in my life to, so I don't like the fact that I'm a member of the Royal Irish Academy. But it's our National Science Academy, and therefore I have to accept the word royal. There's lots of fights you can have in life, but that's one that you should maybe avoid. Okay, so, um, I'll give a, a quick, a very quick 45 minute talk. Um, I'm gonna try and cover, well I mean, let's talk about the title, Research Challenges for Low Carbon Energy Systems. I'm an electrical engineer, I'm like Daniel, I'm glad he calls me an old friend, because he's even older than I am. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna try and give you a sort of a, a historical perspective as well as sort of a, a here and now perspective, okay? I'm also an electrical power engineer, and myself and Daniel are involved in electricity. I'm gonna try and get out of electricity a bit. I'm gonna deal with electricity, but I'm gonna show you. So I'm an electrical engineer. Most of my talk will be about engineering, electrical engineering, but it'll also be a little bit more about the broader energy system as well. Uh, low carbon is about renewables, nuclear efficiency, fossils. It's about all, but I will concentrate a lot on renewables because of my background. I will concentrate a lot on electricity, but I just wanna make the point, it's about low carbon, which I'm trying to talk about. I'll talk about the concept of energy systems integration and electrification, which I think is very important. I'll give you some results from integrating variable generation over the past 25 years. Um, and I'll try to give an energy systems perspective. The energy systems perspective in integrating renewables has come about in the last five years, and you'll, you'll see why as well later. And then I'll talk about some of the, the challenges. This picture here, if anyone wants to ask questions, please do while I talk, okay? I've lectured in this room before, and you know what the problem with this room is? You have to lift your head up, Daniel. You, you want to get the, 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 the angle down a bit here. Okay, so my perspective. That's a picture of me, uh, I don't know, 25, maybe 30 years ago. So I'm gonna give you a historical perspective, and that's a picture of me about two years ago. I wanna point out here though, and this is sort of perspective. I am from Ireland, that's where I was born and raised. I actually flew in from Dublin yesterday. Uh, but I have, over my career, worked all over the world. I've worked here, I've, I will, so this picture here, this is my daughter, it's the only digital photograph I have of the time that we spent 20 years ago. I was in the University of Washington here with Rich Christie and some other people for a year sabbatical, uh, 1999, 2000. And that's the only, on my computer, and that's the only digital photograph I have of our time here. I have others, but they're not on my existing computer. And it's my daughter who did uh, some sort of martial arts class here in, in Seattle. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, you'll, you'll, you'll see in my presentation, I've been involved in lots of different organizations in my time, NERC, uh, IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, ESAC. Uh, these two down here are very relevant. Airgrid is the Irish system operator, and an awful lot of my work has been funded by them for years and years. And ESIG is an organization I'll talk about as well. It's the Energy System Integration Group, which I'll introduce as well. So I'm Irish. This is the island of Ireland. This is the globe. I've worked here. I've done a lot of work in China, I've done a lot of work in Europe, a lot of work in Australia, so you know, I've had a lot of experience internationally. I don't know if that just does me any good, but. So, who here knows lazards? Two hands, that all. No one else heard of lazards. Well, in fairness, I only heard of them recently myself, so I'm, I'm a newbie to it as well. So lazard is a US organization, I think, or is it US? I think it's US. But they put out this version of the levelized cost of energy. Levelized cost of energy, in terms of what I'm speaking about, is a flawed concept because it's just literally talking about what's the cost of a megawatt hour, okay? But the problem is, can you get that megawatt hour to the customer is the system aspect. So I, I, I realize that it's a flawed concept, but this is Lazard's report. There's other sources for information like this, but this is a, a reasonably well-respected one. And it's 2018 
version 12. And if you look at it, and these are unsubsidized costs, okay? And if you look at the unsubsidized costs in this graph, if you concentrate on it a bit, the cheapest single megawatt hour of electricity in a levelized cost basis in the US, according to Lazard, is wind. Unsubsidized, the cheapest single megawatt. What I mean by that is, you know, so wind is at $29. You know, it, it ranges up to 56. There's, way, there's, there's, ex, there's more expensive ones as well. And there are cheaper, you know, other megawatts. But in terms of the single cheapest megawatt you can find in the US, it looks like it's wind. The second cheapest is, anyone? It looks like it's solar PV, tin film, utility scale at 36. So the two single cheapest megawatts of electricity you can get in the US at the moment are wind and solar. That's not saying that they're cost competitive overall. It's simply saying if you were to find one megawatt, what's the cheapest one? And it's unsubsidized. Now, you could say Lazarus is wrong, right? I don't, you know, that's in here to there. The other interesting thing about this graph is that on nuclear, this is conventional, on nuclear, it shows you, does this laser pointer work? Does anything work? Did you turn it off? <laughs> Nothing works. You turned it off, didn't you? If you look at it, nuclear, you see nuclear? the 28, and you see coal, the 36. If you read the footnotes in the report, they are the operational costs only. In other words, if you had a nuclear power plant and all its capital is, you, you, the capital is there, and if you have a coal plant, all the capital is there, that's the operational cost, the levelized cost of energy. And you can see, yes, nuclear power plant on a levelized cost basis, operational costs, are $1 cheaper than the cheapest megawatt of wind. What that shows you, in fact, is that Wind and solar are not only the cheapest megawatt, but they're actually cheaper than the operational costs of already invested in nuclear and coal. Yeah? What does that say to you? That says, on this basis, that it's the end of coal as the end of nuclear. That's what it says. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate about it. And what the future it appears to be, it appears to be wind, solar, and gas. It appears to be the future. And then if you look at the variable renewable generation growth in the US, these, this is data from NREL. Uh, in all the slides I have, I do have footnotes to try and uh, attribute the, you know, it's good practice to attribute everything to somebody. So they're, they're pretty much all there. This is, this is data from, from NREL. And this shows you wind and solar growth in the US, OK? But forget about that for a minute. I've had, in the last two months, emails into my inbox from all over the world about the growth rates, as far as I'm concerned, the world has, has reached a tipping point. And myself and Daniel were talking about it. It's very simple. The world's about to go renewables. And the reason is very simple. It's nothing to do with the environment. Screw that. It's got to do with money. And money changes things faster than anything else. So wind and solar are growing dramatically. So let's take the global energy system. These are, this is Sankey diagram. This, these are slides that I got from the IEA. They are a little bit dated. It's 2013, which is nearly six years old. They still apply, though. So it's a Sankey diagram for the world. It shows you all the energy sources and the, the energy sinks, et cetera. And you can see there that we're starting to clean up this part. So we're starting to put more wind and solar onto the electricity system. We've only started. I mean, there's very little of it. We're starting to do it. But if you look at this is the this is the two DS, this is the two degrees. This is some scenario that the IEA did in 2013. These scenarios have all changed in the last few years, but they, they still apply. And what we're what we're doing is you can now see that what in this scenario, what they're saying is by 2050, we'll we'll put more energy through the electricity system. And one of the reasons is because I can decarbonize electricity. So if I want to decarbonize the whole energy system, I can decarbonize electricity probably easier than most other parts of the energy system. And therefore, if I electrify things, that's one of the reasons why people are electrifying. It's not the only one, but it's one of the reasons. And you can start, you can help to decarbonize the others, okay? And what that leads to is this energy system integration. So this is a concept that uh, myself and a few others a few years ago, this, is a, this diagram comes from NREL. And we, there's an energy system integration facility in NREL, okay? And the whole concept is, is that the energy system is now becoming more coupled. And what I mean by that is, if you take it, you've got electricity, thermal, and fuels, right? You've got water, data, and transport. So what you're finding is that electricity, the thermal, thermal energy system, and fuels are starting to merge together a bit more. So for example, if you start to electrify heat, you're starting to take heat and electricity and put them together. 
uh, it's also starting to, to merge with water, data, and transport. Transport, electric vehicles. Electricity, if you try to electrify it. So the thing is becoming more coupled, okay? And if you go back to this diagram here, if you, if you switch between that and that, you can see that the cross-coupling between, you, if you look at it, if you look at that, and you look at that, you can see that the cross-coupling is becoming greater. Because what's happening is, is that we're electrifying more. We're also, if you want to use waste heat, what's the best way to do it? You know, you can use waste products to, to produce other energy products, et cetera. So the other thing about this is that not only is the coupling happening across the energy vectors, but then water, data, and transport are not energy vectors. But I mean, how much, I mean, you're in the Pacific Northwest here, water is pretty cheap, but down south here, those fellas in California, they use an awful lot of electricity to pump water, treat water, because they've got water shortages. So you find that, that, that the water energy next is important too. Data's in there too, because a lot of this has been enabled by cheap telecommunications, cheap ICT, et cetera. But also the coupling is happening across the different, you know, you're also having a coupling between the customer and the reader. You, you have a situation now whereby demand side management in people's homes starting to become more popular, et cetera. So you're having this coupling across space. So you have this coupling across the vectors, coupling with other infrastructures, and a coupling across space. So the system is becoming more integrated. And we coined the phrase that energy system integration is a process of coordinating the operation planning of an energy system across multiple pathways and our geographical scales to deliver reliable, cost-effective energy service with minimal impact on the environment. So this is the whole concept of the whole energy system. Note the word coordination, yeah? It's not optimization, yeah? I dropped the word optimization because if you think about this as a purely mathematical problem, you'll get the wrong answer. This is not a mathematical problem, yeah? Because you know, it's an engineering system, but in that system there's people, yeah? The best will in the world, you're not gonna optimize people. That's the wrong thing to do, okay? You can coordinate them, so it's just a, a softer word. You're very dour a lot. I, I'm gonna shag off to the pub, will I? Why are you, why are you sitting there like just, ugh? <laughs> Any life in you at all? So we're, <laughs> we're listening, it's good. Yeah? Are you the spokesman for the class? <laughs> okay, electrification then. I've mentioned this already. This is data from BP Energy. There's lots of this data out there you can find at BP. I like to use data from oil companies. It's interesting because the oil companies are the oil companies and they are putting out this data. It's always good if someone says your data is wrong and say it came from an oil company. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of doing it. But anyway, this is BP. You can look at the data yourself. It's basically saying we're using more energy, but we're using it more in electrical form. Time goes on. And this is a statement from the IEA. Electricity counts for 19% of total final consumption today compared to 15% in 2000. So we're using more energy, but we're using more in electrical form. It's not only happening because of decarbonization. It's also happening because if people move to cities, it's, it's the modern form of energy. It's clean, at the point of, it's clean at the point of use. It may not be clean, but it's clean at the point of use. It's also a much more, if people move from, from rural areas in, 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 in Africa into cities, they tend to get electricity. And also it's part of the world, I mean, electricity now is to some extent is not only a, it's almost a right, I don't mean that in about, you know, they're trying to, you know, one of these um, United Nations goals is to electrify the world because it does bring, you know, literally electricity helps you keep your drugs you know, uh, your medication, cold, and all the rest of it. It is survival. I mean, the electricity helps people. It helps the quality of life of people. So it's also that as well. So we're definitely electrifying. So how many people here are electrical power engineers? This is the future, guys. The business is good in terms of long-term growth. You'll be fine. So let's talk about renewables and integration of renewables. I want to start here. This is a paper that we published in 1996. Yeah, that's a long Long, long, long time ago, yeah? That's almost 25 years out. Can you give it to me? It's 25, that's 23 years ago. We'll say, we'll call it 25 years ago. But this work was done almost 30 years, or you know, 25 plus years ago and all that sort of thing. And I'm gonna go from this to a paper in 2014, so I'm gonna skip about 20 years in two slides, okay? So bear with me. So it all started with lock tests. Anyone ever hear of a lock test? Does anyone recognize this diagram? It's a power system, yeah? You've got your generators, thermal units, combustion turbines, hydro units, load. This is supply-demand balance, yeah? And if there's a difference between them, the frequency goes up or down, yeah? The thing on the right is an analogy for a power system. 
Note in this work here, and this is a diagram from this paper, there wasn't a single mention, there was all thermal power plants, which were probably coal, combustion turbines, which probably oil actually, believe it or not, in those days, yeah. And hydro and pumped and turf, turf units. You know what turf is? Turf is the most carbon intensive fuel the world has ever known. Uh, it is low quality coal, if you could believe there is such a thing. Uh, and its carbon intensity is three times that of gas. And we burn it in Ireland, believe it or not. We still do, actually. And it's subsidized, which is just, that's a different story. Anyway, but if you look at it, there's not a single, there's no wind on this system, isn't that right? None. OK, so that's an important point to make. So the lock tests were you locked, literally locked the governors of these devices, because this is a, gov this is a governor. And what you did is you deliberately dropped the unit. And the reason we did it was, th these are re this is actually not a simulation. This is a real test on a real system. They locked the governors. They deliberately dropped, dropped one of the other generators. And they let one unit respond. And they monitored that unit. And the classic case is, if I monitored one unit, and everything else is controlled, then I should be able to say what happens with the load. That was the concept of the experiment, OK? This is a real experiment on a real system. It will never be done again, ever. The reason is, is that when people look back and say, you're crazy, because what would happen if you genuinely lost a bigger unit during this and had all the lock governors, the system would black out. But anyway, the important point is that it produced this data. That data, uh, 25 years later, right? was a result of this. Now there's about, I know, there's seven PhD theses and probably 20 IEEE transactions papers in the middle there somewhere that I just missed, right? It ended up in this, okay? So this is a, the All Island TSO Facilitation Renewable Study. It's a study done in Ireland. And it's about how to get more, or how, how to put more renewables onto the Irish power system. And actually, it's the entire basis of it is based on this, believe it or not. There's not a single megawatt of wind in our analysis here. It didn't exist at the time. Well, sorry. In 1996, I think we had two megawatts in the system, right? So we're only starting to think about it, OK? Uh, but this work actually resulted in this. And this is not an academic study, because this guy, this guy, yeah, those two guys there are both in the system operator. And in fact, this is the actual, this work is implemented. This is actually real live research work in implementation of the system operator. So I'll explain what this diagram is. It's called the system, anyone here at the SNSP? The gentleman there nodding, you've heard of it? What does it mean? Uh, the amount of generation that can be supplied by non-conventional machines. Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair assessment. So it's the, it's the system non-synchronous penetration limit. So what it is, is this diagram shows you wind plus imports over low plus exports. It's got a green, a yellow, and a red area in it. The cross diagonal lines of 50% and 75% represent, the 50% line represents a line at which the instantaneous penetration of wind, essentially, non-synchronous generation, uh, is 50%. In other words, 50% of all the megawatts are of the ratio of wind plus imports over low plus exports. So a first order approximation of wind over load because we do have some interconnection. And what it says is the green area of the system is OK. And the reason that, the sort of the background reason to this is, back to this diagram here, is that this is, I lose a unit and how the system responds. If you put lots and lots of wind turbines on the system, they are not connected to the system synchronously, and therefore there's a power system dynamics issue. And I'm not going to go into it, because like I said, there's, there's 25 years of work in between. But anyway, they, they found out that the system was fine below 50%. Between 50 and 75%, it was in yellow. There was problems. Sometimes the system would have a problem. And let's be clear about it. This is not, these are not limits to do with steady state operation. The system will work fine. It's if I lose a unit, the system doesn't recover. So it's a dynamic question, OK? And then uh, from 75% to 100%, it was red. So basically, this was a limit. This limit was imposed by the Irish system operator. On the basis of this work, they imposed a 50% limit. So they would, they would curtail wind. If the amount of, of, of electricity being produced by wind went over 50% approximately, they would curtail it. And the reason was, if there was a fault in the system, there was so much non-synchronous generation in the system and so little synchronous generation in the system that the way the system would behave, it wouldn't recover. Now, having said that, like I said, 25 years 
Multiple reports, there's a lot more detail than what I just said, but that's in essence what it is, okay? And they implemented this limit and they started to curtail wind. This is the 22nd of February 2019, okay? And I want you all to look at this. This is actual wind generation about actual system demand. So first of all, and this is not made up or whatever, this is real, and it's live, you can go to this website and see it. How much energy, electrical energy, are we getting from wind in that day? Approximately? Is it more than 50%? The limit that I talked about was instantaneously 50%. At some stages, is it more than 50%? Yeah. And the reason is, is because in the last number of years, the yellow region, they've started to go into it. They've done all the good old fashioned engineering work required to go into the yellow region. So now the SNSP limit is 65%. Also, the SNSP limit includes imports plus exports. Also, the way it treats pump storage is different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So don't anyone say to me, this is not consistent with that. I agree with you. But to go into the exact nuances of why, I'm not going to. However, the really interesting thing is at night you can see, can you see a correlation between the wind and load at night? You can see the way they sort of, yeah? It's almost tracking it. And it's because it was hitting the SNSP limit. They were keeping the wind. So as the load would go down, the wind would go down. It wasn't that the wind was correlated with naturally, it was that they were curtailing it. And you can see this correlation go on. And just to sum it up, it's great to see research work that you did 25 years ago that didn't include wind you know, being implemented to do this. So I was very lucky at the time. I didn't know at the time the work we were doing would be so relevant, okay? But I'm lucky, I've always been lucky. Okay, let's talk about variable, any questions? You keep me on time, Dino. So uh, variability, so again, this is May 2011. The reason I picked May 2011 for this is just it's a quirky month. Uh, so this is wind in, in Ireland in May 2011 for the 19th of May and the 21st of May. It's the May average and the yearly average. So first of all, let's look at the May average and the yearly average. Ireland is in the Northern Hemisphere. It's actually further north than here, isn't it? I think it is, yeah. Where approximately Seattle weather and Dublin weather are not that different, yeah? You probably have a little bit warmer, but, you know, but that's about it. So what's the windiest months? So we, we have roughly the same weather, yeah? We're both westerly facing. Hmm? Yeah, so the windiest months are November. What's the least windy month in Seattle? Huh? August. Yeah, summer month, yeah. Is May a summer month? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I mean. May is a summer month, yeah. Maybe not in terms of temperature, in terms of California, but a summer month. So here's the question for you. How come the May wind is higher than the yearly average? Like, you know, the logic we just went through is the windiest month in Seattle is probably November, December. And Seattle and Dublin and Ireland are approximately the same weather, right? Why? And the answer is, it turned out that May 2011 was the highest wind month ever recorded on record in terms of records were ever kept. Now, on average, May wind is actually much lower. But that month was twice as much as the yearly average. And the point about that is, this stuff is variable on all time scales, okay? And you can get really weird things. It actually turns out that December 2011, it turned out that year was actually higher again, but that was just a, a, an odd thing that happened. Anyway, so let's go down to the daily variability. So that's the sort of seasonal variability. I'll then go to the daily variability. You can see that wind and two, they're not consecutive days. 1921st of May is different. That leads to the case of wind variability, more flexibility is needed. So if you're trying to keep supply demand balance, yeah? If I've got a lot of wind generation, and if the wind is variable, then you have a situation. This is a stylized diagram from Michael Milligan of NREL. And it showed you wind, net load, and load. And you can see, if you look at the red trace, that's one week. You can see there's a regular pattern in terms of the demand on a power system, yeah? And we, we pretty much, you, you know, you can do load. I remember when I was here 20 years ago, there was an awful lot of work done on load forecasting, et cetera. Forecasting load is, is relatively speaking, pretty easy, yeah? You know. This is, this is Tuesday, yeah? Tomorrow's Wednesday. Oh, the load is probably going to be approximately the same tomorrow as it is today, yeah? The weekends will be a little bit lower. If you put in wind then on the bottom, wind from a marginal cost point of view is free. Therefore, you'll take as much as you want. So the thing that you have to follow in terms of supply-demand balance is the blue thing, which is now much different on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So maintaining supply-demand balance requires, it says steeper ramps and lower turnaround rates. You need the system, the rest of the system, to be more flexible. You need those other power plants in the system, be it nuclear, be it gas, be it coal, whatever, to be more flexible in order to maintain supply-demand balance and the need for flexibility. And just very simply then, if you look at the impact of flexibility, flexibility is one of the big, uh, big topics inside wind integration. People talk about you need more flexibility. Just to point out, flexibility is not just physical flexibility. It's not just the fact that the gas units or the thermal units can ramp up faster or go down slow, you know, whatever. That's all fine. Uh, also, sorry, one, one form of flexibility is curtailing the wind is a form of flexibility. It costs money, but getting rid of it is, is a flexibility. But also the institutional mechanisms, whatever market design rules you have, they have to be flexible too, so it's not just physical. Anyway, I, I want to get sort of to the other uh, generation technologies, coal and gas and nuclear, and this is the way I'm going to transition to it. So if you have a situation where you have more wind in the system, you find that the thermal units, because remember, if the wind is built or the solar is built, it's zero marginal cost. Therefore, you'll take it if you can. Uh, so what you find is, and this diagram shows it, you find that this is, this is showing the CCG, to combined cycle gas turbines and coal units. It's showing you the ramping and the utilization factors. What you're finding is that in a situation where the wind energy penetration goes up and up and up, and you can see it's gone from 0% up to about 50%. Ireland's wind penetration level at the moment is around about 30%, okay? But you find as the penetration level goes up, you are ramping the units more and more, up and down, up and down, up and down, and you're also using them less. So the total amount of energy you're getting from them is less. And this costs money, yeah? Because thermal power plant were pretty much built to be base, a lot of them are built to be base loaded. If you ramp up and down things, you do damage, et cetera. So there's this whole issue that if you put lots of wind and solar in the system, the rest, it impacts on the rest of, of, of the fleet, okay? Which brings me to this slide. It's about cost, reliability, and benefits, okay? So I've got three reports up here. The first one on the right is the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, and they had a report in 2011 on uh, renewables, okay? And I was on two, two of the chapters of that report, one on wind and one on integrated renewables. And one of the interesting things about that report that I learned, a life lesson for me, is I went to the meeting in Brazil, the first meeting in Brazil, and there was all these renewable technologies, wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, um, ocean, you know, they were all there, whatever. And the really interesting, and I was doing the integration to sort of put it all together. And the really interesting thing about it was every single technology there was writing its chapter, and the first line would say, my techno our technology X will solve the climate change. Every single one said exactly the same thing. Without doubt, yeah? Like they all said it. Bio, wind, they were all, so they were all advocates, which was crazy. The simple fact of the matter is it's about a combination of those technologies, not just about any one. But also, look at this, the cost of decarbonization, system costs with high shares of nuclear and renewables. This is a report from the, oh, we did the, there's the international, or the NAE, is it the Nuclear Energy Authority, or some international organization called the NEA, or the International Atomic Energy Agency, various ones like that. They've come out now, because they see that, that renewables are growing, they're saying, how can nuclear work with renewables, yeah? Okay, that's the basis of that report. This is a report, there's more, pro rata, there's more nuclear energy in France than any other country in the world. I think it's around 75% electricity, maybe 80, somewhere between 70 and 80% electricity comes from nuclear. So in terms of a country, they have the highest penetration of nuclear by far, okay? I think the US probably has more nuclear power plants overall, but as a percentage, it's France. Power gen this is a report they just put out, nuclear power plant flexibility. All of a sudden, the nuclear industry is saying this is 2019, isn't it? 2019. That's, that, that diagram is in 2015, but this, this report was published in 2019. They're now coming out and saying, by the way, we're flexible. 10 years ago, they were coming out and saying, we're not flexible. So the realities of life are starting to bite. They're starting to become flexible. Now, uh, this report, so what you're finding now is people are looking at the future and saying, we all have to work together, okay? And I think it's a really important point about this. I mean, when you're not going to decarbonize overnight. You're going to have coal, oil, ga coal, gas, and nuclear there. And it's better that they work well together. Okay, we're going to spend a lot of money. This is IEA data, right? These, this is the International Energy Agency, World Energy Outlook 2018. 
Um, and they've got all sorts of lovely data in there. And let's not dig into it in too much detail, but look, on the left and on the right, new policy scenarios, sustainable development scenarios. The new policy scenarios are pretty renewable orientated. The one on the right is very renewable orientated. But in fact, it turns out to do 1.5 degrees Celsius, you have to be even more renewably orientated, but that's neither here nor there for the moment. The first thing is, there's only a slight difference between them, 15% higher, yeah? But the difference is enormous. So in other words, it's saying, this is the amount of money that we're about to invest in stuff in the energy system. I'm not talking about fuel costs or labor costs. I'm talking about stuff, yeah? Uh, metal, yeah? Products, yeah? Generation plant, transmission, uh, oil pipelines, you name it, it's all in there in some way. And also on the demand side, yeah? In industry, if you're gonna electrify it, et cetera. We're about to spend 60 trillion in one and 68 trillion in the other. I don't care who you are, that's real money, yeah? Now the difference between is only 15%, but it's still eight trillion, yeah? That's even enough to make a dent on your national debt. Oh, only a bit of a dent, but nonetheless, a bit of a dent. If you'd stop spending money on your weapons, you might just save a few bob, but that's a, that's a, different, that's a different story. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is, if we're gonna spend this amount of money, isn't it as well that we try and do it in a sensible, logical, and I say coordinated, I don't say optimization, I say a coordinated manner, yeah? To try and make it at least to spend as efficient as possible. Would you agree? So that's the reason this is really important. If you look at the whole energy system, the way it's gonna go, it's better off that you do it in a coordinated manner that's efficient, rather than just doing it higgledy-piggledy. And coordination doesn't just mean do the electricity system well, it means do the electricity system with the transport system, with the heat system, do it all together in a coordinated manner. What about the demand side? So I, I mean, I am, typically, most engineers, most electrical power engineers are what they call supply side people, yeah? We build generation, we build stuff. But the demand side is really very important, extremely important, okay? And if you look at these numbers here, if you, if you look at these slides later, you'll find that somebody, you see end use, you see those things here? You know, they are very, very large blocks of this. There's a lot of money going to be spent on that. We're going to, you know, if we're going to electrify heat or transport or industry or whatever we're going to do, we're going to spend a lot of money on industry and in, the, and in, in the commercial buildings, et cetera. So what about the demand side? I've used this slide for 10 years, maybe more, because the data actually comes from 2010. So I haven't used it for 10 years. I've used it for about nine years. But I've used it continuously. I always say to myself, I'll update it, but I never update it because it always works. So what this is, this shows you 2010 wind data from Ireland on a monthly basis and 2010 low data from Ireland on a monthly basis. And the wind data is scaled up so the area under the curve is the same. So this is 100% renewables. So just say you said, I want to go to 100% wind, okay? And the first thing you do is say, well, just you know, increase the amount of wind you have up to the point whereby the amount of energy produced by wind is equal to the amount of energy you need. So the first problem you face when you look at that is what? You have too much wind, too much, too much wind in the winter and not enough wind in the summer. Back to my May 2011 point, yeah? May 2010, you can see, was much lower than the average, okay? So that was a year, so that makes my point that I was making earlier really on. So people say to themselves, what do you do with this? So bear with me, this is sort of a thought experiment. What do you do with this? Someone says, build storage, yeah? Store all that energy in the winter and move it to the summer, yeah? We have one pump storage station on the Irish power system, one, okay? Cost a billion dollars to build. I think there might be one other site we could do it on, and that's even if they would allow you to do it because it's in a very, very beautiful area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how many pump storage stations would you need to achieve to move all the energy from the winter to the summer? 5,000 of them, yeah? So that's not gonna work, okay? That's a heating device, that's an electric car. Uh, the other solution is I'll use demand side management, yeah? I'll charge up my electric car in the winter and drive it all summer. Is that gonna work? <laughs> no, it's not gonna work. The point I'm trying to make here is that demand side management is a very nice concept, but in terms of what's really needed as we go into the future, it's irrelevant, yeah? It's just not gonna work at all. In fact, it's just not gonna work at all at all, yeah? They are, it's of use, there's no doubt about it, but it's not the real solution. The solution, in my opinion, is that, and I was talking to Daniel about this earlier, you're gonna find periods of time when there's gonna be enormous amounts of renewable energy that are for free, and I think what'll happen is that industry will adapt. 
Industry are very clever when it comes to making money. And I think what should happen or might happen is that we'll start to develop industries that say to themselves, what can I make, for, what can I make that I, the, the processing plant I have to make it? It's low capital cost. It's completely automated, right? And automation is easy nowadays. Yeah? It's getting easier. It's completely automated. It's low capital cost. And I can consume large amounts of free energy for short periods of time to make a product that I can sell to someone. I don't know what the solution to that is, but I'm just thinking that is the business opportunity. And maybe with the same piece of equipment, you can make two products. One, you can make that uses a lot of energy over a short period of time. And the other product is when energy is the normal price. So you might have adaptable. So I think, and remember, we're about to spend trillions on our energy infrastructure. So some of this money, I think, will be spent in industry in a way that is developed so that it, it, it looks at the future and says energy will be cheap sometimes, sometimes it'll be expensive. I mean, let's be clear about it. what's what's one of the single most carbon intensive industries in the world? It turns out it's cement, yeah? It's not only is it from an energy point of carbon intensive, but it actually produces carbon itself. So the cement industry set itself up on the basis of energy is cheap and available 24 7, 365 days a year. What would happen if industry said energy is no longer cheap all the time, it's cheap some of the time? They will adapt. And the classic case of that is that the aluminium industry, yeah? Aluminium is shipped from the tropics to Iceland yeah, to get the bauxite out of it. Why? Because they worked out the economics and said, I dig it out of a hole here in, in Africa. I send it to Iceland. And it turns out the energy there is cheaper because it's got a lot of renewables. So people will adapt. You know, you know, industries adapt. That's, that's my take on it. How am I doing for time? Uh, OK. So I realize that if you aggregate wind and solar, this, this is a sort of an extreme case, but if you aggregate wind and solar, you get a different answer. I'll skip this. I'll skip that as well. So storage. I was talking about storage, and you couldn't do it in Ireland. However, there's a place pretty close to here, but it's on the other side of this continent, Quebec. Quebec has 189 terawatt hours in dams, in, in stored water, yeah? You've got a large hydro system north of here in Vancouver or in, in BC. Yeah, it's nothing in comparison with this thing. Quebec has 189 terawatt hours. Yeah, in storage, that is real storage. Yeah, it turns out if you to do the calculation, a guy sent me an email about half an hour before we started. He's from Quebec. He's from Montreal. He, he's a philanthropist. He's a billionaire philanthropist who's putting money into this area. And he just did a calculation. He's asked me to check it, but I'll give you the numbers he did. If you wanted to get this amount of storage from, uh, I, I know this calculation would be right. If you wanted to get this amount of storage from Tesla cars, yeah? How many Teslas would you need? Huh? Who said a billion? Good man, very close. Two billion. But you're still very close. Two billion Teslas. How many, how many uh, vehicles in the, uh, you know, passenger vehicles are in the world? Apparently there's 1.3 billion. So in fact, to get that amount of storage, you would need more, almost double the number of cars in the world there are today, all to be electrified. So you can see what I mean. This is storage. Cars are not storage. They're just irrelevant. Yeah? But he just did the calculation he sent to me. I don't know if it's true or not. I'll have to calculate it. He calculated if you do this in power walls, it would cost $122 trillion. And even if it's only $12 trillion, he's out by an order of magnitude. You're just not going to do it, OK? So this is real storage. Anyway, the reason I show you this is if you take this region of this continent, which is Quebec, Ontario, the Maritimes, New England, and New York, and you have to try to decarbonize them, you can actually decarbonize them pretty easily, actually. And it's because Quebec has this storage. So you might, so in other words, remember I showed you in Ireland, you had to, you know, I need 5,000 pump storage stations. You couldn't do it. But up there, because of Quebec, they actually have enough storage in Quebec to actually decarbonize the whole system. If the Quebecois would get on with, if the Quebecois don't even get on with the, their fellow Canadians, never mind the Americans. So it's all political, OK? It's all, will they do business together? Will they build transmission? Will they actually have coordination going on? And this result shows it here. I won't show it in huge detail, but basically, this is Greenhouse gas reduction levels from 1990 levels, 80% to 100%. These are different scenarios. But I'll just point out, if you do optimal transmission capacity and institutional integration, the bottom one. In other words, if you build a transmission between them, if you operate the markets, the institutional flexibility, if you operate them together, you can actually go from 
But the change from 80% decarbonization is 22, but if you go back here, it's more expensive, there's no doubt, yeah, than the current situation, because even though I said wind and solar are still cheaper, solar is not cheaper in, in Quebec, why? In that part of the world, because the sun doesn't shine, yeah? So, because I'm pretty sure those cheap megawatts of solar I showed you at the start are probably in Arizona, they're not in the Northeast. But it's not that much more expensive. If you don't do that, the blue one on the very outside, no trade, you get a situation where it's two or three times more expensive. So there are places in the world you can do it, but it shows you that, in, that, that, that because this is institutional integration and physical with, with transmission lines. But the problem with transmission lines is the trilemma plus the consumer is a quadrilemma. There is such a word as quad, everyone's heard of trilemma? There is actually a word called quadrilemma, I was pretty amazed. Everyone talks about the, the trilemma being security of supply, affordability, and sustainability. My own belief is that there's a missing part of this. There's a consumer, it's a quadrilemma, because I think that the consumer is really important. And why? One of the reasons that this may not happen, not only the fact that the Quebecois are a bit more, a bit, I, I lived in, in Montreal for six months as in Miguel. They're nice people, they have lovely food and all the rest of it, but they tend to be a bit sort of, what's the word? Quebecois, that's it, they tend to be a bit like that. But even if you could get over all that, people, you're gonna to have to build lots of this stuff, transmission. People don't like it. So you end up in a situation whereby it's about the consumer. And I actually fundamentally, absolutely believe, and I'm gonna get into trouble with the engineers here, we're spending lots and lots of research money on engineering research that's completely useless and a waste of time, yeah? And we're much better off funding our social science colleagues to understand society. It would probably have a bigger impact. I'm getting some complaints about that, am I? I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> How am I doing for time? Five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one there. That just shows you some work that we did on trying to maximize the transmission capacity, but I'm just passing that. Then we electrify heat. So I'm gonna go back to this then and say, well, what about electrification? You know, can we do this by electrifying heat? So what this shows you is uh, the yellow one is, is the demand from water heating. Water heating is pretty constant over the year. The sort of orangey one is, is uh, space heating. And the blue one is electricity, okay? So, and what it's showing you, so electricity demand over the year, water demand over the year, and space heating demand over the year. But this is not looking at all the space heating, it's looking at a fraction of it, around 20% or so, okay? Anyway, if I was to electrify heat from this diagram here, what would happen to the electricity consumption? Just on a macro basis. Huh? Double. Double or treble, yeah? Just on a sort of macro basis, okay? So if you'd electrify heat, then all of a sudden on a simple basis, you go back and say, well, you're gonna to have to build way more of these things, yeah? Because they need more capacity. And society will complain. So you've got this problem. So electrification is gonna come with its challenges, which is I need to build more stuff, yeah? And people don't like stuff that big transmission lines, et cetera. However, if you look at it then a little bit more granular, if you could use storage heaters, in other words, because heat occurs during the, you need it during the day, yeah? Okay, and, and at night the demand is lower in electricity systems. So if you could shift it during the day, you might avoid all this I mean, on a macro level, there's no doubt about it, that looks like it's double or triple or something like that. But if you go into far more granular, looking on a daily basis, you might be able to shift the load, and therefore you might be able to save building all this stuff, okay? That's just it in a simple pen picture, okay? It turns out, though, when you do the numbers on it, et cetera, this is some work we did on it, and I'll just show you putting these diagrams. In order to avoid building this stuff, right, uh, and the one on the right is, if I, give you, if I give the system operator complete control of your storage heaters, yeah, I do storage heating, I heat, the concept is I, I charge up the storage heaters at night and during the day use them for heating, yeah? It should balance out supply and demand. It should reduce the amount of capacity you need and bring it down. You should be able to avoid building transmission. That's the sort of the idea, okay? However, and this is some of the data from the, from the actual results. However, it turns out, you see the top right hand corner? That's a storage heater in a, somebody's nice front room, yeah? It's nice and pretty, isn't it? The main reason that you can't do this is the following. 
It turns out that that will not work. It'll work a little bit, but not much. It turns out that the amount of storage you need is far in excess of the size. And what'll happen is you say to people, I need you to have storage heaters because I'm going to reduce the amount of transmission I need to build, etc." This sounds like a great idea. You're going to have to build an extension to your house for the heating device because it's going to be so big. <coughs> so that's just not going to work. Yeah? So there's some great ideas out there, but they don't work. And the reason, one of the things about storage heating, this is data from a friend of mine called Juha Kivilumis from Finland. And the actual source of data, he's, yeah, I should have put them in. There's actually direct, there's, there's more sources. But anyway, if you look at storage for heat, heat is very easy to store, isn't it? Heat water, put the insulation around it, pfft, you know. But the thing about heating, or storage and heating is the following. It's all got to do with volume, yeah? If you fill this room with water, hot water, right, the only thing that really costs is the structure and the insulation on the outside, yeah? But remember, the amount of surface area on it goes up by 6a squared, but the volume goes up by a cubed. So the bigger the storage device is, the cheaper it becomes, because the, the cost is in the, the walls and the insulation, yeah? So thermal storage at scale makes sense. So you can see what happens. This is the dollars per kilowatt hour, right, of storage heating. Look what happens. It drops dramatically. Like it, it drops by almost um, uh, two orders of magnitude. So thermal storage is cheap if it's bigger. And that's why this solution here does not work, because these are small storage heaters. They're very expensive, but if you make them bigger, it would start to work. And I'm just going to go over this. And the place you might be able to do that is in places where you have large centralized housing, a place like China, where you have enormous uh, complexes of apartment buildings, yeah? And you have centralized storage at scale, the economics start to work out. And the solution I just mentioned would actually, could possibly work. Okay, to finally to finish out then, global community. So um, this is the Energy Systems Integration Facility at NREL, which I have an office in. This is, the, the, so, you know, the US Department of Energy built this building called the Energy System Integration Facility around this whole concept of all the energy vectors coming together across scales, et cetera. This is the this, this set plan. The set plan is a sort of master plan for Europe, yeah? It didn't include Brexit, I have to say that. I'm an Irish man. Brexit is, is the revenge of the Irish on the British, but that's a, a different thing. So the set plan, it's sort of a master plan for energy in Europe, okay? And if you read this document and download it, and there's 15 sections to it, if you look at it, the two central messages out of that do document are, it's all about integration of the whole energy system and the consumer at the center of it. And I am not a big fan of the European Commission. I've had many fights in my day. This document is extremely well written. I didn't write it. And it's a very good document. But if you look at it, the key messages are, the future is about the consumer at the center of it, yeah? And how to put it all together in an integrated fashion, okay? And I will leave it at this communication. So one of the things about this whole area is that it's extremely difficult to communicate this material. Why? Why is it extremely difficult to communicate this material? It's all bad news. You're bad news, Rich. <laughs> because it includes electrical engineering, thermal engineering, nuclear engineering, social science, economics, yeah? It's, in order to get the benefit of what I'm talking about, it requires a lot of disciplines, yeah? And you know, it requires a lot of experience, et cetera, and it requires people to work together. And therefore, communication is extremely difficult in this area. So this is ESIG, which is the Energy System Integration Organization. It's an organization with about 180, 180 different companies and organizations around the world come together to, let's say, promote this area. And we had a meeting in London a couple of weeks ago. We had a meeting in Albuquerque about a month ago. And we also have a MOOC, Massive open online access course in this whole area. So if you want to go and have a look at it, please do. So conclusions. So a low carbon energy system is about the demand side. I, I didn't talk about energy efficiency, right? But I, should, I mean, it is incredibly important. Energy efficiency is unbelievably important. It's probably the single most important thing to do of all. Uh, it's about supply side, and it's about all of them. It's not just about renewables. Renewables, nuclear, and fossil. Fossil is going to be there for a long time to come. And it's all about the whole system integrating together. We're on a tight timeline. So one of the things I didn't mention is some of the work that we did 25 years ago, we were doing wind penetration levels of two gigawatts. And they were taught to be sort of 20, 30, 24. You know, it was research. Look 50 years in advance. 
We're looking at two gigawatts, three gigawatts. How much wind is installed in Ireland now? 3.8 gigawatts. So some of the numbers that we're dealing there that were supposed to be 20, 30 years out turn out to be half what we actually have right now. This area is accelerating faster in our research. And I think one of the dangers is the universities are all the time thinking, you know, 10 years out. This area is going faster than universities can possibly keep up. Multidisciplinary, it's got to do with everybody together, and strong communications are required to ensure impact. Because if you can't communicate this material, it's a complicated area. You've got to get people to actually take these concepts on. It's difficult. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Very interesting presentation. I'm sure it's going to Can spark imagine a what number I would have said if I didn't sign this? <laughs> I can't say we're going off the record because you're on the video. <laughs> so, who's going to ask the first question? Daniel. So we can't optimize people. How do you propose we coordinate them? Oh, sorry. We can't optimize people. How do you propose that we coordinate them? Can't optimize people that you don't coordinate them. Well, look, I'm not a social scientist. I, I can get out of that. I did, I mean, I'm one of the editors of the IEEE Power and Energy magazine, and there was a special issue a year ago, and, and I was the editor. Every single article was written by social scientists. So you're going to have to do more social science work to try and convince people to do this side of stuff. So you can't optimize them, but we're going to have to understand human beings. If human beings want to decarbonize them, I think a lot of them probably do, and they want this type of future, they're going to have to accept certain things. But how you communicate to them, it's not true people like me, it's true social scientists. But it's a really important thing to do. And you don't optimize them, you coordinate them. Because you know? optimization has a connotation of, you know, an engineer is going to tell you what to do. So you need to be more subtle than that. And I'm not the person to give that message. I can hardly coordinate my wife, so I'll... <laughs> I have no, no control over it all. But it's incredibly important. I, I absolutely 100% believe that challenge is no longer technology. Mainly the challenge is societal. That will be my opinion. But there's still room for engineers. We're, we're still we're still got a good future. Maybe you should do a dual degree in, in psychology and, in, and electrical engineering. OK, next question. No questions. Ah, Daniel. Two Daniels. Please. Daniel Kirshen, Daniel. Daniel. Um, so you said you don't believe in demand response as a large-scale solution to the annual variability in wind supply and things like that. No, do you see a role? For, um, do you see a role for it in shorter time-scale problems yeah. like transient stability? Yeah. So, so I think okay. So I may have misled you. I absolutely believe demand response is important, but it's not going to solve that sort of longer-term problem. So yes, it's an important it's an important thing, but it's a need. It's like it's like everything, you know, all, none, not one of the renewables is going to do it. They have to work together. It's, it's, it's all of the above, right? But in terms of the longer term, I think demand side response is not just taking the existing industry and making it flexible. It's actually designing industries for the future. You know, in other words, build the industry now. Like I said, the aluminium industry or the, the, yeah, the alumina industry decided take raw material from subtropical Africa ship it to Iceland to smelt it, because that made economic sense. I'm just wondering, my question is to those industries, if there's going to be a future where sometimes the energy is incredibly cheap and sometimes incredibly expensive, you know, can you design an industry process or processes that suit that? So I think demand side management is incredibly important, but it's at a planning and design stage you need to solve the problem, not when you've built it. Because we build, at the moment, we build industries to run 24-7, 365 days a year on the basis that the energy is always there. If you have a future where the energy is not always cheap, what processes will you do? So I believe demand side response is incredibly, incredibly important, but it's a design issue of what future energy demand will have rather than the existing one. Does that make sense? Good. I bet you the guy behind him's name is Daniel as well, is it? <laughs> uh, no. What's uh, your name then? Nathan. Nathan, good. Uh, my question is, so you had those Lazard numbers, um, and it was all unsubsidized. Yeah. Um, what is the impact of subsidization on those numbers, and, and what do you think the, the future of subsidy um, have an effect? Can, so, can you repeat the question? So the question is, in, in, the Lazards, in the Lazards data I showed, they were unsubsidized. And the question is, is what impact do subsidies have? Yeah. And the simple fact of the matter is, if you go and Google that report, they have the data with subsidized numbers in there, too. 
uh, subsidies are bad news. Subsidies are only, should only ever be put in there to bring a technology to the stage the society wants it on and after that. So I don't think there's any future for subsidy at all because subsidies distort everything. You know, so I don't think there's any future. Well, what will happen to those numbers in Lazarus' numbers is wind and solar become even cheaper. Yeah? Uh, and they're definitely in the money, and that's why people are building so many of them. But as those subsidies die away, so wind and solar costs are coming down. So in fact, uh, good friends of mine in NextEra, their big US company, they've said that they've done the numbers on it. They show that as the subsidies die out, the cost, it, there's almost a perfect one-to-one -one correlation what's happening. As the subsidies die out, the costs are dropping at almost the same rate. They're in the money all the way through. So, you know, and that's the, that's the best place to have it. And it's better that we do this from a purely economic point of view. I don't care how environmentally friendly people are. They generally money is much more important than them. That's a terrible thing to say, but that's the way people are. Well, sorry, that's the way my generation is. I absolutely believe that your generation are different. And like, who here is after money? Oh, you yeah. <laughs> know. Well, I have three kids who are all about your age and older, and I have to say they are incredibly, what's the word, environmentally friendly, conscious, conscious people. But mind you, when they get married and have a house and a, you know, whatever, they might become different. What is it? You're, you're liberal? What is it? When you're young, you're, you're left wing and with a social, what is it? Yeah, when you're, when you're young, you're, you're left wing and socially aware. When you're old, you become a conservative. Is that it? But I, I absolutely believe that your generation will do it much better than we ever did. I hope. But I think that you don't have to be worried. I think that the wind and solar are now so cheap that it's just going to happen anyway. More questions? Have you seen this new storage facility? Can I just, there's this, I just saw this YouTube video last month. And they've got this wind energy coming in, and they've got these cranes that are picking up big five ton pieces of concrete, stacking them up, the store there. Yeah. What do you think of that? Uh, not a lot. Not enough capacity or? Well, first of all, why would you immediately put wind into them? You know, I mean, the most important thing about, well, when it comes to storage, you, with renewables and storage, always try and use the energy now because storage is always a waste. So that's the first thing. So storage is not, is always a, is it worse? It, it's, yeah, it's not a good solution because you, have, you waste energy. There's lots and lots of ideas out there. And if you do the numbers on any of them, they're all very expensive. And they're not getting cheap anytime soon. There's no doubt about it. Batteries are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But I don't see a situation where we're going to get, we're not going to solve some of the problems I've just said with batteries and things like that. I absolutely, well, let's talk about what is possible is, you know, people are talking about electricity to fuels, electrolysis. And that's incredibly expensive as well. But it's probably a better solution than the one, one, the one you just said. I think we can get to very high penetrations of renewables without having to have storage, yeah? Uh, but it's going to be expensive. There's no doubt about it. Back to Daniel. So you're bumping up against these non-synchronous generation limits in Ireland sometimes now. Um, are you seeing the power markets uh, starting to adapt at all as a result of having all this free energy sometimes? Are you seeing industries starting to adapt there? You're starting to see, well, you don't even have to go to Ireland. Just go to California. You don't have to go to Ireland. If you go down to California, they've got this duck curve, and they have all this solar PV on people's roofs, et cetera, and you're having negative prices already. So you are seeing, I mean, you are seeing this now. So it's happening right now. And people are very innovative. If people see a steady market price that there's going to be large amounts of free renewables available, they will, I guarantee you, some of people are very clever when it comes to making money. So we are starting to see it, but the market design issue is interesting because myself and Daniel were talking about it. It no longer becomes a, a market for energy. It may be a market for capacity is more important. So market design is going to have to change as well. That is for sure. But markets have always adapted. But I think the adaptation rate is going to happen much faster now. So market design is an important area. It's going to have to adapt, and it is adapting. Okay, more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Mark again. Okay.